Amen. Uh, one of the questions that came uh, into uh, the basket back uh, several weeks ago uh, had to do with angels. And uh, the question really was, do we have a guardian angel? And that kind of really is a, a broader scope of a question uh, about the nature of angels and who are they and what do they do. And uh, it's a topic that we, we don't look at too often, uh, even though there's angels you know, scattered throughout all of the Bible. We see them Old Testament, New Testament. So this morning we're going to take a look at uh, this notion of the angelic. And typically when we think of angels, we, we normally go into like a Victorian mode. Uh, we, we have these images of these you know, uh, beings that are floating around very graceful and with the wings and the whole nine yards and uh, sometimes we have those little Christmas card pictures with these little chubby cherubs and the wings and, and they, they you know they, they're, they're kind of like this cutesy thing uh, in reality that's not the case at all uh, in fact uh, Whenever you hear of an angelic encounter in the Bible, uh, the follow-up, uh, as soon as somebody sees an angel, it's, don't be afraid, uh, because apparently they're very terrifying. And uh, when they come into uh, manifest themselves physically so that humans could actually see them, uh, there's, uh, there's normally this trepidation that just grips the soul. And uh, so this morning we're going to take a peek here as uh, uh, who are they, uh, what do they do, and, and how do we engage them? You know, or do we even engage them? You know, how, how do we inter interface with this group of beings that are out there? I mean, we just sang about it two seconds ago, the, this notion of angel armies and everything. Uh, what's that all about? And uh, that's what we're going to look at today. So uh, the question starts out with, who are the angels? And uh, an angel, by definition, really is, is very uh, simple. Uh, in Hebrew, the word is malak, uh, and in Greek, it's angelos. And both words translate messenger. Uh, and that's really quite simple. They, an angel is a messenger. Uh, the word for angelos or malak uh, could also be for a human being. Uh, the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, uh, that is where, that's the root for the word messenger. And uh, that's also the word that's going to be used for angels. So it's interchangeable. And uh, they're, uh, they're both... Uh, uh, found the angels are found both new and Old Testament, and in the nature of angels uh, we see uh, kind of heads into some different directions. Uh, they're described as sons of God, uh, holy ones, uh, or even a host. And when that word host appears, uh, that's normally in reference to an army, uh, like we had just sang a couple of moments ago. Uh, but uh, the, they're spiritual beings, and we're going to start in the book of Hebrews here. Uh, we find that the scriptures explain to us that uh, the angelic realm is, is spiritual. Uh, are they not all, it tells us, uh, ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? So we really see two very uh, important uh, points here in this passage in Hebrews. Uh, the first is that uh, there's a ministry that takes place, and we're going to unpack that in a little bit. But these are spiritual beings, uh, which means a couple of things. First off, they don't get married. Uh, there's no angelic weddings or anything like that. You don't have, uh, you know, uh, you know these, these types of things. Nor do they reproduce. They don't copulate. So you don't have like the little cherub nursery with these little baby angels and everything else. You know, none of that happens, okay? Uh, and uh, there, there's no death. They're, they're immortal. Uh, because they're spiritual beings. And uh, so they don't have a beginning, in it, or they don't have an end. They do have a beginning, though. And uh, we find here that they're, they're created beings. Uh, the psalmist explains to us in Psalm 148 uh, that the angelic uh, host, if you would, uh, are, are part of God's greater creation. It says, him, uh, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all stars of light. Praise him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. So we find here that the angelic uh, realm uh, is, um, they're immortal. Uh, but they also have a beginning, uh, but no sense of an end. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, there's, there's not just a few scattered about, uh, but Revelation tells us that there's uh, a bazillion angels uh, running around out there. Uh, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne of the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Uh, so you have every, every, uh, every variety available, uh, every make and model, every, every imaginable uh, stock that you could feature there, there. There's just some sort of an angel, so there's, there's no shortage of them. Uh, that we see here in Scripture. Uh, they seem to have greater qualities when it comes to wisdom and strength than people. Uh, however, there's something unique about angels that we see in the book of Corinthians, and that is, um, even though they show a greater level of aptitude than we have right now, uh, we're going to judge them. 
Now that's kind of a strange idea here that we're going to be judging angels, uh, but it tells us right in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, uh, do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? Uh, which indicates that uh, in the created order of things, uh, humanity is number one. Uh, and then we have the angelic and then we have everything else underneath. And uh, we, we have this place, and, and no one's really quite sure what it's going to look like other than that uh, in Revelation it mentions the fact that uh, the church will have an opportunity to sit with Christ on his throne, uh, which is above, beyond any possible privilege anyone could ever imagine. And, and that might happen there, where we would be uh, with Jesus on this magnificent throne and uh, looking at these angelic hosts in some form of a judgment. But this is what we're involved with. And uh, so we see this sense of a, uh, a pecking order in terms of how God has created uh, his, his world. And uh, this also tells us that angels have a will. Uh, if they're going to be judged, that they have some sense of choice in what they do. Uh, they may not necessarily have a choice in terms of their office, but they could choose to be either disobedient or obedient. In the scriptures we find, if you dig a little deeper, uh, there are uh, some, some names of angels that crop up. And uh, we see that there are three in particular. Uh, in the angelic realm, there seems to be almost a, a hierarchy uh, or some sort of a, of a pecking order. Uh, when you open up the Bible and you see uh, books like uh, Corinthians, Colossians, uh, even Ephesians, there's a, there's a catchphrase in there like all power and authority or rulers, power and authorities. Uh, th that phrase, uh, which is a, a Pauline usage, is uh, something that we see in the Bible. And it's always a reference to the spiritual realm. Uh, so there seems to be some sense of, of order there. And uh, even Jude makes mention of the fact that Michael is a, an archangel, which means he's, he's kind of like a bigger kahuna over some other, other angels there. Uh, Judaism, during the intertestamental period, uh, from the end of Malachi to the time of Christ, there's about 400 years, uh, during that time period, apparently, uh, the Jews expanded this whole idea of the angelic. They, they named these angels. They had these different uh, offices of angels and, and, and really went way off the deep end when it came to the angelic and, and the demonic. And, uh, but none of that's really supported in Scripture. Uh, they just seem to go down this pathway of you know, having you know, entire names and genealogies and things like that. I mean, they really kind of went crazy with it. Uh, but, uh, but we do know of at least three. Uh, by name. Uh, the first would be Michael, uh, and, uh, which means who is like God, and, and he's the fighting angel. All right. So if, if you're going to have somebody putting up their dukes in the Bible, it's going to be Michael. And uh, we see him uh, mentioned a couple of times in the scriptures. Uh, Revelation 12 brings him up, um, and this is where we see Michael fighting. Uh, and there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, uh, which would be a reference to Satan. Uh, the, the dragon and his angels waged war, and, and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Uh, so we see that uh, we have Michael out there duking it out. Uh, he's mentioned in Daniel as well as, uh, as fighting uh, for prayers to kind of come through and be answered. There seems to be some war that takes place in heaven. And the second one is Gabriel, and he's probably the one of the most familiar ones we see in the Bible. Uh, Gabriel, is uh, his name means God is a strong, uh, is stronger... Uh, or filled with strength, and uh, he crops up in the Christmas story. And uh, you probably recall uh, the, uh, the time of the announcement with um, Zechariah in the temple. That's Gabriel who appears to Zechariah. He appears to Mary. Uh, he's also uh, found in, in Daniel as well. Uh, Gabriel is mentioned just the same. Uh, so uh, he is also uh, a named angel in the scripture. And then finally we have Lucifer. And I know you're all waiting for that one because uh, Lu Lucifer is mentioned uh, in the book of of Isaiah, which means shining star or star of the morning. And uh, that name in, in, uh, in the scriptures, uh, let me move over here, whoops, here we go. Uh, that name of uh, Lucifer is found, uh, it's, it's more in Latin, but most scholars have accepted it as the name of uh, this one fallen angel. And we see him cropping up uh, in Isaiah 14. Uh, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. This is that reference. You have been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. 
I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. And what we see here is not only the identity of this fallen angel known as Lucifer, who many believe was uh, responsible for worship, uh, who was exceedingly beautiful, and who had this uh, magnificent persona uh, that was just so grandiose that uh, he desired worship rather than to give it to God. And, and we find in this this sense of this overwhelming pride uh, that comes to, to play. And uh, we see, uh, as we read in Revelation, that Lucifer has fallen. Uh, he's called the dragon. He's called Satan. He's got a variety of names. And uh, some of his followers uh, are, are uh, you know, on planet Earth, and some of them are thrown into the abyss. Uh, and we, we discussed that several weeks ago. We were talking about uh, heaven and hell and the, the, the possibility of, of a chamber of hell uh, denoted for the demonic. And it tells us here, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, see, this is where we said they have this notion of a will, uh, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved uh, for judgment. Uh, we find here that uh, some of them, are, uh, are cast into, the, uh, into hell, and then the others seem to be roaming around planet Earth uh, wreaking havoc. Uh, the thing that, about uh, the enemy here that we need to you know, kind of hone in on for a little bit is the fact that it tells us in the Bible that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And uh, we find that in 2 Corinthians. Uh, For such men are false apostles. Notice the context here. Deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as what? An angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Uh, So what we see here. And, uh, and I bring this to your attention as we're studying angels, is that uh, just as much as there's, there's a, a good bunch out there running around, there's also a bad bunch. And they seem to be influencing people in such a way as to lead them astray uh, through deceptive teaching. And we're going to expand upon that a little bit uh, later on down the line. But uh, this whole idea of leading folk astray by way of human messengers uh, who have been tempted to believe false hood and as a result of that they propagate that falsehood and and people are led in the wrong direction and if there's ever a time when that's happening it's now Uh, there are so many folk out there uh, who are buying into such uh, ridiculous theology in terms of vari- you know, b- beliefs, uh, discounting God's word, you know, following the whims and doctrines of humanity. And, and that ultimately has a very evil root. Somebody's been tempted to teach such things. I just read this week another fellow. Uh, who was in, in this big band and had some sort of great influence over lots of, of folk and you know he's denying everything uh, related to scripture you know he thinks we could take Hinduism and uh, a variety of other Eastern uh, meditation uh, concepts and splice them together with Christianity and just run down these very unusual strange paths and basically discount uh, large swaths of scripture and, and and this has been happening over and over again every once in a while you'll just you know go on to the news and you hear another Christian leader either doing something extremely stupid or denying the faith and embracing uh, a worldview that is contrary to what the Bible has to say so what we see here uh, is uh, the, when we if we were just to, to summarize uh, that God here and uh, I'll bring up my first first major point uh, is that God created angels as spiritual beings with unique attributes. And, and that's what we're, we're looking at here. The greater question is, what do they do? You know, what, what, what do these, uh, these angelic creatures do? And there's really uh, three spheres, if you would, of service. Uh, they serve God in heaven. Uh, they serve Christ during his earthly ministry. And they serve us, which is pretty wild. Uh, so we, we see God, Jesus, and, uh, and then finally us. Uh, the, the most classic picture of that is uh, in Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. Uh, How do they serve God? They worship Him. They praise Him. Uh, And it tells us here in Isaiah 6, 1 through 4, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings. With two He covered His face, with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called out to another, saying, Holy! Holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. 
And uh, you, you see this awesome picture here in heaven of these seraphs. And uh, I, I found an artist's rendition of one. And it, 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 when we talk about angels, uh, that's perhaps the most clear picture I've ever seen of what a seraph actually would look like. Uh, just terrifying. Uh, flaming, molten, that's what seraph means in Hebrew. Uh, it, it means to glow and to be a flame and, 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 and you see them, they, they can't even look at the holiness of God. It's so powerful and awesome that they have to cover their face. Uh, they have to cover the rest of their entire bodies. They can't even expose themselves remotely uh, to God uh, because of the grandeur of his, his glory. And they're suspended as they're flying in midair, proclaiming the holiness of God uh, in the temple. And, uh, and this, if we ever want to talk about you know, a possible picture, uh, and, and again, this is, this is just a human idea here of what one of these things might look like, uh, that would be it. Uh, it's not this Victorian thing running around with these nice curly locks and perfect complexion and, you know, this nice robe and they just have this gentle persona. Uh-uh. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're terrifying. And, uh, and, and this would be a, a portrait of that. Uh, the second area in which the angelic uh, will minister is to Jesus. And we see that uh, right with his annunciation, with Gabriel coming on the scene. Uh, we see it during Jesus' temptation. He's out in the desert, and uh, he is uh, uh, you know, hungry, he's being tempted, and it tells us that angels uh, attend to him at that point. Uh, during the garden, right before his crucifixion, that evening uh, on, his, uh, on his last night here, right after the Last Supper, he's out there, he's praying, he's in agony, he's, he's sweating drops of blood because of the, the tension that is coming upon him. He knows his fate, he knows the punishment he's going to face, he knows the pain, the agony, the rejection he is going to go through. And as he is going through this tumultuous moment in his prayer life, it tells us here, uh, that an angel came and attended to him and strengthened him. And finally, when we see the ministry with Jesus and the angelic, the greatest area is the book of Revelation. Uh, you want to do a fun study, and, and we wouldn't even, it would take us months to do it if we were to you know, work through each verse. Uh, but if you want to go home and, and explore the angelic, read the book of Revelation and look for angels. They're everywhere. They're under every rock and bush. You know, the, the seal judgments are angelically uh, executed. The, the trumpets are blasted by the angels. The bowl judgments are executed by the angels. They're chucking hailstones. They're, they're separating people. You know, they're, they're, they're slaying people. I mean, you, know, you don't want to mess with them in Revelation. Uh, they are wiping out large quantities of folk. I mean, they are just executing all of God's perfect and holy commands uh, as uh, Jesus' return is being ultimately prepared prepared. Uh, so they're, they're everywhere uh, in Revelation. In fact, the one book of the Bible that has more references to angels is the final book. And uh, we see that taking shape. Uh, but for us here and now, what do, we, what do they do with us? Uh, what is their ministry? And uh, uh, visibly speaking, it's, it's pretty rare uh, to actually uh, you know, have some sort of an angelic encounter. And in fact, there's, there's times in the scriptures they crop up, uh, but not often. Uh, you'll see, uh, like in the case of, uh, in the Old Testament, Joshua, uh, right on the eve of the invasion of the Promised Land, an angel appears to him and strengthens him. Uh, we find in uh, the book of Daniel, you know, Daniel has some interaction because uh, he is receiving a tremendous revelation about the coming of Christ, uh, the apocalypse, uh, world uh, judgment, I mean, all sorts of wild things happening in Daniel, and there's uh, a flurry of angelic activity there. My favorite, though, and I wanted to share this one with you is found in the book of, uh, of Kings and it involves Elisha. Uh, Elisha is being attacked by an entire army. Uh, the king of Aram is coming after him and uh, Elisha and his servant are in this uh, little village and here's what we see that takes place. Uh, so he said, go and see where he is and I may send and take him. And it was behold him saying, behold, he is in Dothan. This is uh, the king of Aram going after uh, Elisha. Uh, and he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city and they're, they're ready to pounce on Elisha. Uh, now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. Uh, and his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? <laughs> so he answered, Do not fear, just like we were singing a few moments ago, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. 
Then Elijah prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and saw, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Uh, what an awesome scene. And, uh, and we, we find that happening uh, nowhere else in the Bible, but we find that happening here, uh, at least where we have the opportunity to see it. Uh, in the book of... Uh, Acts, we see some angelic activity, uh, especially like with the ascension of Christ. A couple of people appear to the uh, dis disciples. Uh, Philip has an angelic encounter. Uh, Peter's locked in jail, and uh, I think they're looking to execute him, and an angel comes in and breaks his bonds and opens up the jail doors and opens up the, the prison doors and gets him out and, 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 and frees him. And uh, there's, a, there's a scene in the book of Acts at the end where Paul is uh, you know, on a stormy sea, and he, they're going to get shipwrecked, and an angel appears to Paul and you know encourages him and says, "Yeah, I'm going to save everybody. Uh, the ship and the cargo is going to get destroyed, but you and the crew will live." You know, we, we, we see a little bit of that there, but, but that's about it. Uh, there's there's really not much more. We know they're out there, uh, but we only see uh, a few instances where uh, there's these appearances, especially in the New Testament. Uh, so the question is, what what do they do? Uh, they're around. We know they're active. Uh, but I think what we read this morning in Psalm 91 captures perhaps the greatest essence of what the angels do do among us today, and that's protect us. Uh, Psalm 91 talks about, you know, that he'll send his angels concerning you that you might not, what? Strike your foot against a stone. Uh, there seems to be this protective nature of the angelic. And I wanted to share with you uh, a passage that... Uh, and this is where a lot of people start to wonder about the guardian angel business. Uh, Matthew 18, 10 and 11. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And uh, that coupled with... Uh, Psalm 34, 7 really kind of captures the essence of this. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescue, rescues them. Now, do we specifically have a guardian angel? I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, I mean, the Bible doesn't say one way or the other. And uh, I know some people think that they, they know theirs and they talk to theirs, and I, I wouldn't go there. I, I really wouldn't. Um, I mean, I know some people that probably need a whole herd of angels to keep charge of them because they make so many stupid decisions. Um, but uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, if we have one, two, ten, two hundred, fifty thousand, I mean, who's to say? There's nothing in the Bible that tells us uh, one way or the other. So we really can't go out on that limb and say, yep, I, I've got my guardian angel and his name is Clarence and he just got his wings, you know. It, it just doesn't work that way. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but what we do know is this, um, that, that they seem to be protecting us. Uh, they seem to be out there and camping around us and, and keeping watch over us. And, uh, and that's a good thing. And uh, every once in a while you'll hear these stories, and I don't discount them. You know, I, I knew of a, uh, a missionary couple there in Africa, and uh, there was a group, there was a bunch of thugs coming in. They knew there was Christians in this village. They were attacking Christians. They wanted to kill them. And uh, they came to their hut, and uh, they, they were about to, to pounce on them. They had guns and everything, and as they approached the hut, uh, they saw it surrounded by other, other men with guns in hand, and they all fled. And, and one of them that fled was eventually captured, and uh, they, they asked him, you know, why did you guys flee uh, this, this hut that was just out there by itself? And they said, well, because it was surrounded by all these people with guns. And they said, well, there was nobody out there. I mean, there, it was just a hut with a couple of missionaries sleeping inside. You know, and, and that could have been an angelic encounter. And I don't, I don't toss that away. I mean, these things may, may very well happen. Uh, but... Um, it's, uh, it's one of these things that, uh, you know, it's, it's few and far between and you don't go, don't go necessarily looking for it. Uh, one of the things I, I, I put out there as a caution is, uh, you know, a lot of folk, and I, I've met people from time to time, they, they seem to feel like they have these, these close relationships with these angels uh, that are guiding them and directing them, and, and I don't buy that. I'll be very honest with you. Uh, I, don't, I don't buy that at all uh, because it tells us that the role of the Holy Spirit is to lead us and to guide us into truth, not the role of an angel. Now we see a couple times in Scripture these messages coming through, but they're very unusual. They're, they're not the norm. And Jesus promised us at the end of his ministry that when he leaves, he will send us his spirit, and that his spirit will remind us of things to come, 
remind us of things in the Bible, and guide us and direct us. And God's Word is the lamp to our feet. God's Word is the light unto our path. God's Word illuminates what we should and should not do. And because of that, I am very, very leery when somebody says, well, you know, my angel was speaking to me last night. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. I, I just, I, I really struggle with that in, in, a, in a big way. So the question, well, first off, our next, uh, our second point is simply this. Uh, angels minister to God and people, but almost never disclose themselves to us. Almost never. Uh, because of what we see in the, in the Bible. If, I mean, if you have the apostles and some of these great men and women of God who have been going through the ages uh, and serving the Lord with such fidelity, if many of them have never seen anything, uh, then there's, a, there's really a low probability that we will ourselves. Uh, that's why I don't have any great testimonies to share with you this morning. You know, I was, you know, a lot of times I like to share a cool testimony, but, you know, sorry folks, but I wasn't like driving to, through Newark, New Jersey and stopped at a gas station and a bunch of thugs were coming at me and some big dude shining in armor jumped out from behind the bushes with his flaming sword and sent them running the other way. That's never happened to me, so uh, I, I can't, you know, I thought about it. I thought, man, I could come up with some really cool scenarios, but none of them are true. So, uh, uh, so long story short, they, uh, they, they minister to us, but uh, their appearance is exceptionally rare. So the question, of course, is what do we do? Uh, how, do we, um, how do we engage this? And the first is, in many respects, we don't. We really don't. Uh, because there's so few incidences of human and angelic encounters, uh, we have to be a little wary. Uh, the first thing is you, you don't pray to them. And uh, I, I bring that up, and, and this, this, you want to talk about like the do 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 moments. Uh, the other day, when I finished this sermon, I wrapped it up, I put everything together, I got all my slides put, put down on a, on a separate uh, 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 email text. I, was, I just finished, and as soon as I got done, I clicked on a YouTube. The first thing on my YouTube page was a guy exposing a false teacher who is preaching to his congregation that we need to talk to angels all the time. I was like, what is this about? I'm literally seconds after I finished this message. This guy uh, is out there speaking to tens of thousands of people, explaining to them that we have to be able to communicate with the angels so we could have an effective ministry here on earth. And he's going on, and, and people are buying into this. I mean, the, the, the stadium was huge, and they're buying into this. And he's, he's misquoting Daniel because he says, well, Daniel needed to learn a new language. And it tells us in Daniel chapter 1 that Daniel learned this new language so he could communicate with angels. And it's like, no, it didn't say that. Daniel chapter 1 says he learned how to speak to the Babylonians. He learned their culture so he could interact with them. He wasn't learning some angelic language so he could talk to his guardian angel. He, it, it, was, it was completely pulled out of context. So I, I say this because we, we don't pray to them. We don't worship them. We worship the Lord our God and Him only. It tells us in Revelation, there's a couple times, John was so stunned by what he saw in the angelic, he bowed down to worship. The first thing the angel says is, you get your carcass up, boy. We worship the Lord and no one else. So they're not to be prayed to. They're not to be worshipped. And they're not even to be sought. You don't seek after them. What does the Bible tell us to seek? Seek His kingdom and His righteousness. That's what we seek. We seek that relationship with our Savior Jesus Christ. We don't seek His servants. And when, when we, we step it out of bounds, I think, with praying and worshiping and seeking after them, I think that's something that we have to be very wary about. And I think as the times of the end draw closer and closer, more of this is going to crop up. But what do we do? Uh, and I put here my, uh, my little ABCs. Appreciate, be kind, and caution. Appreciate, be kind, and caution. Appreciate God's provision. Just appreciate the Lord and praise God that He has made this unique spiritual provision for us by way of the angelic. Uh, because of that, uh, we have some level of protection. We have somebody out there behind the scenes doing things for us. And praise God for it. 
You know, he has provided for all of our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ. He has provided us with our salvation. He sent his son to die on a cross, to rise three days later so that we could have forgiveness of sins. He sent us his spirit. He's given us his word. He's given us his people. He has just provided abundantly uh, for our need, both physically, emotionally, relationally, psychologically, and spiritually. Praise the Lord. So appreciate, number one. Number two, be kind. And you say, what do you mean be kind? I want to show you a verse here. I'm going to bring up Hebrews 13, 1 through 2. The love of the brethren continue, and do not neglect showing hospitality to strangers. For by this, some have entertained what? Angels, without knowing it. So just be kind to people. You never know who's going to crop up in your path. Some stranger's going to come by your way. And we find here that apparently they come in some sort of physical manifestation. And you never know. There may be somebody who, who needs a, a, a meal, uh, who needs some encouragement, uh, who needs some prayer, uh, who, who has some sort of a problem out there, and they're going to come your way. And I think that we just need to be kind to one another and, and to be cognizant of the fact that you never know who you're ministering to. Uh, the third one, C, was for caution. Caution. Be careful. Uh, most of the stories and most of the things you hear people saying about their interaction with angels, I think, is just bunk. I really do. Uh, especially if somebody says they're getting messages. Uh, listen to what the book of uh, Peter tells us. 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4. Seeing that his divine power has granted us, uh, hang on to this, everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. God has given us everything we need to live a righteous, pure, holy life. All the provisions have been made. We do not need additional revelation telling us how we need to live our lives because he's already given it to us. The toolbox is there. The promises have been granted. Listen to this. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in this world by lust. Everything we need has already been given to us. And God has provided abundantly and generously and we have the revelation we need to understand His will for your day-to-day -day life already found here in the Word of God. And when we start thinking, I've got to go out and start stepping out on all these other limbs, doing all this other stuff, I think we're really getting out of bounds. Listen to what Paul says here as a warning to us in Galatians 1.8. But if even we, or what, an angel from heaven should preach to you another go a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be what? Accursed. Anathema is the word in Greek. Condemned, damned as a heretic. That's what he's saying here. Uh, why is he saying this? Because as the end draws near, that satanic activity is going to increase. Um, Thessalonians says that the coming of the lawless law will be in accordance with what? Work of Satan displayed in all kinds of what? Counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in what? In wickedness. So I, I think there needs to be a caution here taken. We need to appreciate the work God is doing. We need to be kind to others because you never know who you're going to be helping out. And finally, we need to be cautious. I want to kind of wrap uh, up this, uh, uh, this, this little study here with, with an illustration actually from something that happened years ago. It wasn't an angelic encounter, but it gives a, a picture as to how this, this works. And, and that was um, when I was a, a little boy. I was only five years old. Whoops, oh, I turned it off. Um, I was cast into a play. Uh, my father was involved with community theater, uh, similar to like what we have up here at the Haskell. You know, they would put on a, uh, like a weekend show and uh, they would prepare months in advance and then have uh, like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday uh, performance. And I, I was in this play, I was a walk-on. I was uh, in the last act uh, at the very end of the, uh, the play and uh, the director saw me and wanted me to be on the stage. And there was only like eight or nine actors and actresses in this, uh, this play. And I went to the rehearsals and I saw, you know, who the cast was and I met the director and, and learned my part you know, as I walk back and forth with these people in the street scene, and opening night rolls around. 
And I'm all excited, you know, because we, we had a sellout uh, for the entire weekend. Uh, Friday evening, they announced right before the play uh, was going to be presented uh, that all three shows were sold out. And, and, and the theater sat about 500 people, which was really kind of cool. So I, I got to sit in the front row with the director's wife. And uh, I'm sitting there in my, my little suit and ready to go. And I'm, I'm waiting and waiting. And, and the play comes on. And the, the, the place is dark. And the, the show is going. And, and the third act comes around. And, and there is this lady. Uh, she was one of the actresses. Uh, her job was to get me and uh, get me backstage so uh, I could come on stage for my little cameo appearance. And uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, the third act is ready to start and over by the exit sign there's this woman, she gives me the little sign and I go scurrying over there as, as you know, quietly as I could with my suit on and everything. And uh, I get backstage and I look around and I'm like, what's this? I was stunned. I mean, I saw the actors and actresses out there but there's all these other people. There's tons of them. And they're all dressed in black. <laughs> they had these black shirts on. They had black pants on. They had like these, these black shoes, like these, these dancing slippers uh, with, with like, like padded feet and everything. And all they were doing was, was whispering. And, and, and one was you know, over on the side with, uh, you know, with some makeup helping the, uh, the uh, people you know, do their hair and everything. And there's a couple over you know, helping with costume changes. Uh, there was a bunch that were moving the scenes around, you know, the, uh, the, the drop scenes. And then others were responsible for props. And I kind of looked out the curtain. I wasn't supposed to, but I looked out a little bit in the audience. And I saw this above the balcony. There was a bunch of them with the lights. And they were moving things around. And, and I'm back there. And I'm thinking, my goodness, you know, I only thought there was eight or nine people uh, who were in this play. And to my surprise, there was more than double the amount of people who were behind the scenes uh, making this presentation, this production, what everyone saw. You know, everyone in the audience just saw eight or nine people on a stage. That was it. But what they didn't see was all these other folk behind the scenes, you know, pulling the levers and moving the props and making sure everything worked just fine. And that's really how I see the angelic realm operating. Uh, you know, Shakespeare once said, you know, all the world's a stage and we are, we are players. And, and we're the ones that we see. But behind the scenes, behind the curtains, uh, in the shadows back there, there are others that are serving and working. And we call those others angels. Uh, and they have been created intentionally to serve. They praise God. They work with Jesus in terms of his ministry. And they seem to be protecting us as well. And I believe that we should just appreciate what God has provided. We should be kind to others because you never know when you're going to interact with one. Be very cautious because Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And you never know uh, when somebody's going to crop up in your life and try to deceive you. So we need to test everything with scripture. And in doing so, I think we'll be able to walk that path that God has for us. Let's pray.